your uh, trajectory so far. So I understand you did your uh, undergrads in Darmstadt at the university there, studying physics and computer science. Uh, and then you went to, to do a PhD with uh, Emanuel Bloch at the uh, Max Planck Institute down in, in München. Uh, and I know you did a very, very interesting work there on Rydberg spectroscopy uh, and like exciting uh, crystals uh, of, of Rydberg atoms uh, when working already like with quantum gas microscopy and you continued also like working uh, with that like on a three-year Dicke fellowship uh, at Princeton uh, University with Vasim Barker mm, before then joining or like forming your own group uh, at the University of Virginia um, where you again work uh, with quantum gas microscopy to simulate fermionic, fermionic and bosonic um, many body systems with cold atoms. And I guess uh, today we'll hear you on your latest work uh, on um, quantum gas microscopy of strongly correlated fermions in optical lattices. Okay. Here. Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction. And yeah, uh, thanks for the invitation to give this talk here. Um, so I will be presenting my yeah, latest work on uh, that I done in Princeton at, uh, in the group of Asim Barker. And then in the second half, I will also uh, uh, talk about um, what I've been recently doing at the University of Virginia. And I will discuss some of the plans and uh, status of the experiment. So yeah, so my subtitle is uh, kind of the, the road from strange metal to spin liquids. So I will talk in the first part essentially about uh, our transport experiments at Princeton and then it will continue uh, to frustrated systems. Okay, so let me start with the motivation why we want to look at these systems. So there's a lot of uh, very interesting strongly correlated materials in condensed matter physics that are all uh, very complicated and sometimes very hard to study. And so just pick the picked a few examples there yeah, for example high temperature superconductors um, that are still um, yeah have some mysteries remaining in certain regimes and then uh, there's uh, systems like heavy fermion metals where the electrons seem to require like a, a larger mass than you would expect um, and there are also recent uh, systems that uh, got a lot of interest like twisted bilayer graphene um, and on the other side, there's also these uh, systems like spin liquids, where you um, essentially get no ordering, even if you reduce the temperature essentially to zero. And here, this example that I'm picking here is uh, Herbert Smithite, which has been recently found as one of the uh, first um, realizations of that um, in a condensed matter system. And uh, interestingly, also these spin liquids have some connections to fractional quantum Hall states because in both cases you're expecting to, uh, you're, expect, uh, you're expecting uh, fractional excitations. So uh, these these uh, systems are all very complicated, and often in the real systems you have uh, like um, either impurities or some details that are hard to uh, cover in detail. And so often it's uh, interesting to just first look at a simplified model system. And for the uh, high temperature superconductors, it's believed that the square lattice Hubbard model kind of uh, captures a lot of the um, qualitative behavior. And uh, on the side of uh, spin liquids, uh, one could uh, think about uh, looking at uh, fast rated Hubbard models. And so that's kind of now the structure of my talk that I will first go into the square lattice Hubbard model and then later talk about the square lattice Hubbard model. And so what is the motivation now to use uh, alter called atoms to simulate condensed matter systems? And uh, the first thing is that for alter called atoms, you can uh, use fermions and you get the direct analogy of uh, fermions in a lattice compared to electrons in an ionic lattice in the condensed matter system. So on the left side, you see essentially the, the ionic lattice of the, and then the electrons hopping between the uh, different sides in the lattice. And you can uh, create a similar system uh, in a called atom system by just uh, creating an interference pattern with laser beams and then having fermions hopping from side to side. And yeah, so the advantage of uh, alter gold atoms is then that essentially you can uh, control completely all microscopic parameters. And that's for example, density or interactions. And uh, th these are things that are normally pretty hard to uh, control in, in a condensed matter system. And then, uh, of course, if you create your um, lattice potential via um, an interference of laser beams, there's also kind of no real lattice impurities in, in the system. Um, 
And then um, also going a bit into measurements, of course, you can now in the code atoms, you can look at dynamics um, of the atoms in the lattice because your time, uh, time scales of this um, uh, dynamics get into the millisecond regime. So you can really track what's happening, uh, which is very hard for it uh, with electrons, of course. Um, and then um, the larger uh, interparticle spacing also makes it um, easier to really see in the virtual atoms. And that's kind of the point of quantum gas microscopy that we can essentially look at all individual atoms in the system. And they can even manipulate individual atoms on a, a certain side. And the other advantage of cold atom systems is that uh, essentially for a single particle, you can solve the whole system. And so you can really focus on uh, the quantum many body character of the problem. So you really know what happens for a single particle, but you don't know what happens for, for a large system with many particles. And then uh, another point is that you really get uh, access in these systems by quantum gas microscopes to uh, multi point correlation functions. So that's something that is very hard to obtain with other. Okay, and then I wanted to just go give a little bit of an overview of what are the motivations to do quantum simulation and give a few uh, uh, directions. Um, so uh, there's a few yeah, directions that you can go to. For example, uh, um, one big direction in quantum simulation is to look at dynamics. So there's this experiments uh, with Rydberg, Adams, and Howard, uh, where you can really see uh, these uh, quantum scars. And there's a quantum many body localization experiments and also our experiments on transport. So this is all kind of time evolution, which is pretty hard to calculate in uh, quantum many body systems. And then another direction is um, uh, some to topological or frustrated systems, um, where simulations are often hard because uh, some standard techniques don't really work, like quantum Monte Carlo uh, kind of fails in such systems. And then uh, yeah, uh, it's just getting harder with other techniques to, to solve uh, for larger system sizes. And that's also a regime where you really can, can get into regimes that are hard to calculate in quantum simulation. And then in the other directions, uh, for example, you can just increase the size of the Hilbert space by a lot to make calculation hard by uh, switching to, uh, for example, SUN Hubbard models, where you increase the uh, space, by the state space on each side by a lot in the letters and uh, there has been also quite a lot of experimental developments recently. And another direction here is to not only load atoms into the ground band of a lattice, but also into higher bands, which also effectively increase the state space. Uh, and then you can get interesting extensions of Hubbard models. In that field. And uh, one field that I also worked uh, quite a lot in is uh, the field of long range interactions. And uh, there's different ways to obtain also long range interactions in lattices. And uh, one way that I uh, started essentially in lattices is to introduce Rydberg atoms in a lattice system. And that creates uh, very long range interactions, also very strong interactions. And you can um, uh, use that to either study long range interacting spin systems or recently you, you've probably seen uh, Wasim Bakker's talk last week um, that you can also um, combine tunneling uh, so really real Hubbard's physics with uh, long range interactions. Um, and there are other systems that, uh, the, that uh, can do similar things. For example, there's uh, magnetic atoms, um, which have somewhat weak interactions, but are long lived. And we can uh, look at, uh, for example, this uh, Rosenzweig instability here. Or um, uh, uh, there has been also experiment with molecules, uh, spin dynamics and molecules with molecules and lattices. And of course, uh, ions are going to larger and larger system sizes and uh, can do very large scale uh, spin simulations by now. Okay, so that's the overview over the field of quantum simulation. Um, and now for the rest of my talk, I have essentially three parts. The first will be just a rough overview of a quantum gas microscopy to explain a bit what is really the point of quantum gas microscopy and what are the basics. And then uh, I will uh, talk about our experiment on transport and, uh, and the uh, group of Wazi Back and Princeton. And then in the uh, last part, I will uh, show the focus of our experiment here at the University of Virginia and uh, our ideas what we want to measure. Okay, so what's the... Um, story of quantum gas microscopy. It's essentially the idea that you can really image individual atoms in a lattice. And then you can see all of the atoms uh, individually in the, on the different lattice sites. 
And uh, this came up with the experiments in Harvard and uh, at EpiQ. Um, it's, yeah, it's already like 10 years ago. Um, and then uh, more and more uh, species uh, joined, like a terbium, and then also uh, Fermi microscopes. And uh, that's essentially then the place where you can start to get this analogy with electrons. And yeah, uh, um, and, and the main thing that has been studied up to now, so all of these experiments are essentially square lattices, um, and they can put all the study either the Bose Hubbard or the Fermi Hubbard model on square lattices. And now, uh, so this was kind of the step, uh, the last step, going from bosons to fermions, and it's kind of also a question, what is, what is next now? And one direction is obviously to go to different lattice structures, but some people also go to uh, long range lattices. Okay, and uh, what is the main uh, motivation for single atom imaging? And that's of course uh, that you have really site resolved observables in our system. Um, and in particular, what you can measure here is that you can really get uh, the density per site. And what you normally get in these microscopes is uh, what we call the singles density. So that's essentially um, uh, the density of, in the case that you have only one atom per site. So all doubly occupied sites get projected to zero, which is kind of a, uh, proper, a property of this imaging typically. Um, but what you can also measure is essentially the uh, spin at up atom density. So there's some tricks to avoid the problem with doublons um, and the spin down density. And by kind of adding them up, you all get a total density. But there's a different approach uh, also that we demonstrated in Princeton and also other groups have uh, showed different approaches to measure the density of doublons. And so you can get essentially the full uh, density information of the system. And then uh, because you kind of take a snapshot of the system, you also can get uh, arbitrary uh, two point correlation. And in particular, for example, here, like a spin, like a de up, up density uh, connected correlator. And this allows you to essentially extract the uh, uh, intrinsic properties of these correlations in these systems. And and yeah, recently even uh, spin density correlations came up. So if you're able to essentially measure both spin components in the same picture, you can also do spin density correlations. And as an example, I also wanted to show like a correlation between spins. So you can uh, kind of measure the spin-spin correlation function in a Hubbard model. Um, and then you always end up essentially with some kind of correlation panels like this here. So there's on the one axis, that's the difference and the coordinates in x direction, coordinates in y direction, and then this is the, the central point, this is essentially the on-site uh, variance, and then you get uh, the correlations for nearest neighbor, next nearest neighbor, next next nearest neighbor. So you essentially see in a single panel uh, how the correlation function decays versus distance here. And uh, here in red is uh, positive correlations and blue negative correlations. So you see really uh, antiferromagnetic correlations that you can measure here explicitly. Okay. And uh, on an experimental point of view, I also wanted to mention shortly, uh, how, how do we see where the atoms are in these pictures and how do we map it to the lattice? So that's essentially this problem of the deconvolution of the system or reconstruction, how we call it. So we have this picture with the atoms, the green dots are essentially the atoms if you do the image. And then you have to kind of figure out where the lattice structure lies and you can kind of align that properly. Uh, by doing some calibration measurements. And then what we're doing essentially, we effectively fit like uh, a point spread function at each of these lattice sites. And then by doing a histogram of the amplitudes of these fitted uh, point spread functions, we get a histogram like this. And in this histogram, essentially, you see a peak. And this peak is essentially the, uh, the single atom peak. So, uh, and then you can say everything that is essentially a signal around this peak is uh, one atom. And then you have to kind of find some thresholds to decide uh, from what is noise here. And of course, there's a lot of, uh, there's also some noise here that, that creates like a certain distribution around zero signal. And uh, this is kind of a good trick to kind of effectively enhance your resolution of the imaging, because if you have a picture like this, where you cannot distinguish all atoms anymore individually, you can still uh, apply this technique and still get a pretty clear decision what is no atoms and what is one atom. So in that way, you can kind of uh, digitize your pictures effectively and uh, then only work with like, a, 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 yeah, with, with a, a representation that just tells you for each side if there's an atom or not. 
And you can show that uh, this whole process, including uh, the imaging imperfections, you can get like a pretty high fidelity. So yeah, so in this case, roughly 2% error in the image. And yeah, I should mention this, this yeah, reconstruction method was, was uh, kind of pioneered by Stefan Kuhn in the publication down. Okay, and then what do we study with these uh, uh, systems? Uh, if you have fermions in a lattice, so that's the Fermi Hubbard model. So I have to show that shortly on one slide, of course. So the Fermi Hubbard model is just uh, hopping fermions uh, with interactions on a lattice. And so we have a hopping term, uh, hopping uh, called T here. And then we have two spin components that hop the same way. And then if two uh, different spins are on the same side, we get an interaction energy field. And that's essentially the whole definition of the model already. And then um, if you compare what you, um, yeah, so there's a lot of investigations, of course, of this model and um, you expect kind of, uh, and uh, also a lot of uh, calculation suggests that it's very close to the, what you expect for coupe weight phase diagrams. But um, it turns out that it's very hard to confirm from a Hubbard model calculation if these phases that you can observe in coupe weights still really, really exist in the Hubbard model. So a lot of this is not really, Clear, but um, some of them there's kind of uh, they're kind of confirmed, like this antiferm magnet uh, at um, this uh, with a number of uh, yeah with the doping. So uh, you have uh, one atom per side, and you get antiferromagnetic ordering at low temperatures. But these other phases are all not uh, extremely well characterized, and in particular there's there's like a lot of oh, weird physics going on. For example, in this uh, strange, strange metal phase, and that's one of the things we want to look at with our transport measurements. And in particular, the question we want to ask is uh, how much of this phenomenology from the coupe weights we can reproduce by the, by the Hubbard model. And uh, what is essentially really Hubbard model physics in the coupe weights and what is uh, different corrections to that. And yeah, so there have been a lot of experiments already uh, in recent years on uh, Fermi Hubbard physics. And I just wanted to kind of do a short summary or so for example, uh, um, fermionic mod isolators have been measured already without single side resolution in 2008, Estinger and Bloch group, and later with uh, single side resolution in 2016. And then the next step uh, is essentially to also go to larger, so you can also do band insulators. And here you get essentially a ring of one atom per side uh, of mod insulator, and then at higher chemical potential here in the middle, you get two particles per side and then you get a bent insulator. And these bent insulated W occupied sites in this type of imaging get lost and you see a hole here. And then the next step is to look at a, a spin physics. And um, that's essentially kind of a lower energy scale. So it's a bit harder to reach the required temperatures. And there was like uh, directly three groups that essentially got that um, simultaneously. Um, looking at uh, essentially the mod insulator and then kicking out one spin component and you just look at one spin component and then you can calculate correlation functions and get the spin correlations. And here we have a picture from Princeton and you kind of see here in this one region that you essentially get, get one of these uh, staggered patterns explicitly here on the third region. And then you get essentially these correlation matrices that I talked about. But there were also already measurements before without single side resolution. So there's other tricks uh, like scattering uh, of the letters um, to uh, determine antiferromagnetic model. Good. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, I can also stop in between for questions, um, in particular between the sessions. So just let me know if there are questions. Um, but this was normally the introduction, so I'll stop again after the first section on transport. Yeah, people should just like ask questions. Yeah, they should just ask a question. Just uh, kind of raise your hand or speak up um, and let me know. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Um, so uh, now this is the experiment we did in Princeton on transport. And so we were interested in what uh, what are the transport properties of fermions and lattices? And let me first give a little bit of a summary of previous work on transport of ultra Fermi gases. Um, so the earliest I could find was experiments by uh, Heavy Gutter and Co. Um, 
a lens and they looked at the Fermi gas that and how it equilibrates when moving through a lens. And then there's uh, surprisingly few experiments of transport and fermions, uh, interestingly. Uh, so one of the next big experiments is the one in the Bloch group, uh, where Uli Schneider and Carl uh, um, in the group uh, looked at the expansion of a strongly interacting Fermi gas in a flat lattice. And they saw essentially that depending on direction, the transport properties change. And then uh, there's a whole series of experiments in the uh, group of Tim and Esslinger on transport through thin channels, where they have essentially one Fermi C on the one side, and then they let it uh, transport through this narrow channel. And then depending on the properties of the channel, you get different uh, physics here. And uh, then a new experiment by the lens group here is very interesting. Here they essentially uh, split a Fermi gas with like a narrow barrier that's still tunneling. And they get essentially some uh, phase coherence through the barrier. Um, and that's also kind of a transport experiment in some sense. And, uh, but what we wanted to look more at is uh, like a bike transport experiment. And these are all not fully like bike transport experiments, but there are some more recent experiments by the DeMarco and the Tyberson group. So uh, let me just shortly give a little bit of an overview of what they have been doing. So in the DeMarco group, they essentially use the Raman laser system to give part of the cloud uh, momentum kick. And then they essentially looked at how these two clouds propagate through each other and scatter of each other. And then, then they see that this momentum that they imprinted um, relaxes. And they measure this relaxation rate and uh, get some conclusions about the transport properties of the system. And there's also a very nice experiment, in particular conceptually nice, uh, in the Tyverson group, where they essentially use a lattice system and a harmonic uh, confinement. And then they uh, have a system where they can shift the harmonic confinement relative to the lattice. And then what they're doing is they think about the system like a harmonic oscillator, like a driven oscillator and shake the harmonic uh, potential. And then they can measure essentially the full response function. There's a frequency and they can measure the phase and the uh, amplitude response for different driving frequencies. Um, and that uh, would be essentially the dream experiment for a strongly interacting system. But unfortunately, this, uh, this, uh, this technique only seems to work for a weakly interacting Fermi gas because uh, the heating is just uh, too strong uh, if there's strong interaction. Okay, but we wanted to set out and look at a strongly interacting uh, transport experiment. So let me just summarize and uh, distinguish here between two types of transport. So there's this uh, con uh, called conventional or weakly interacting transport. They essentially can assume that charge spin and energy are all uh, transported by quasi particles. So you can think of the quasi particles as uh, these green balls. And then all of these have a velocity V and a mean free path L. And then you get from that just a uh, scattering rate. And then if you um, go through this whole, uh, through the model, you can derive essentially that, uh, that you, can, you can derive a resistivity that comes from this model that essentially mainly depends on the scattering rate. So you get this unique relationship between scattering rate and resistivity. And then if you put this model on a lattice, you see that effectively there is a minimum free path between two particles, which is uh, kind of clear because particles cannot really be between the lattice sites. And this gives you a limit on the resistivity, which is called the multiple of the limit. And then uh, in the limit of very low temperatures, you see you can derive that you get a thermal liquid like uh, resistivity, which scales as T squared at low temperature. Then on the other side, you get um, you can have also stronger interactions, and then it's believed to get that you get uh, unconventional transport. So essentially, strong enough interactions are believed to destroy these quasi particles. So you get kind of a soup of particles in some sense, and um, then what happens is that this Malayan relaxation rate is not directly related to the resistivity anymore. And one example of that is the so-called bad metals, which violate this material for regal limit. So they are obviously not uh, in this category if they violate that. And they often show this uh, resistivity scaling with temperature, linear and temperature at very low temperatures. And this is essentially a concept that comes from condensed matter. So I just wanted to show here also some pictures from this uh, condensed matter review. So essentially, bad metals are defined kind of by uh, violation of the modular limit and this um, non-fermi uh, liquid like scaling of the resistivity. 
On here on the left side, just for comparison, some normal metals where you can see the resistivity versus temperature increases and then saturates below this you have a regular limit for the particular uh, for the corresponding um, metal. While on the right side, there's some bad metals, and you see the you have a regular limit is somewhere down here, but the resistivity just uh, seems to be like not uh, there's like no special feature at this uh, limit. So the resistivity just rises without limits in some cases and even has some weird features. But in particular, if you look at low temperatures, essentially you get this often this T-linear resistivity. Okay, and we wanted to look at that with cold atoms. And there's one particular feature of our cold atom system that uh, makes it particularly well suited to look at that because in principle, uh, this uh, transport is very intimately related to diffusion but it's very hard to measure diffusion directly in a solid state system. Because uh, normally what you would do for measuring diffusion is you imprint some density modulation and look how the density modulation re uh, relaxes. But the problem is you have in a solid state system, you have Coulomb interactions. So if you do a density modulation, you are dominated by Coulomb interactions um, that, uh, that are normally screened in a homogeneous density system. So you kind of, uh, it's kind of hard then to extract the diffusion. So you can do it indirectly, but in our system, essentially we can do that directly. And that's what I wanted to show here. So if you want to measure diffusion, essentially, um, the idea is we use a sinusoidal modulation of the density. So we have a constant offset density N, and then we add a, a sinusoidal modulation with delta N amplitude and then with a, a wavelength or corresponding K vector here, the K. Um, um, and then we can plug this into the diffusion equation. And then we get um, essentially this, uh, yeah, this PK square. And then we can see that um, the amplitude essentially is proportional uh, to an exponential, uh, so it exponentially decays with time with this uh, um, exponential, uh, uh, typically exponential depends exponential of minus dk square times t. And this is essentially something uh, that you can directly measure in our system because you can just, you just have to measure how density modulations of this type decay with time for different uh, modulation uh, wavelengths. And this is essentially what we set out to do. So we uh, need to prepare some density modulation and of course, in the experiment, we find have to find some uh, practical solution for that. So we use a so-called digital mirror device that allows us to project arbitrary patterns on the atoms. So we can project the stripe pattern. I also have a nice picture here how this looks microscopically. This digital mirror device is essentially a lot of these tiny flip mirrors. And then we just bounce light of that and images on the atoms. And yeah, to get uh, kind of grayscales and so on, we just image uh, eight by eight mirrors on the atoms and then we can get essentially fast switchable light patterns of arbitrary shapes for the atom. Okay, and then the question is at which uh, density and uh, doping we want to measure. And we decided we want to go essentially in the middle of this region that's uh, called strange metal here um, uh, at a density or like a doping, which is uh, expected to be roughly above this quantum critical point. And of course we try to get as low as possible in temperature. Okay, and so how do we do that in the experiment fashion, uh, in the end? Um, so we start with the system and then we project essentially the sinusoidal potential on the atoms. But it turns out that's not really enough because um, normally your um, system is always created uh, or your lattice is always created by Gaussian beam lattice beams. So, uh, so Gaussian shaped lattice beams. So um, we have to kind of make sure that, this thing, uh, that the system becomes flat here in the middle. And so we kind of produce a, a project in addition, some undergrowth potential to make it really flat in the central part. And this is then the region in the end that we will evaluate. And then in the first step to start the time evolution, we essentially just switch off the sinusoidal modulation while keeping the undergrowth beam the same, which then leads us to essentially a very flat lattice region that uh, kind of decays with time where the density decays with time back to equilibrium of constant density. And this is our parameter. So we are the strongly reacting regime, U by T around uh, eight. And the density is slightly below half filling 0.83. And uh, the tunneling is like, yeah, around a kilohertz. 
And then if you have these pictures uh, taken at different times, we can average them and uh, essentially determine the amplitude by sinusoidal trends of these, um, of these density modulations. And then we measure essentially how this density modulation decays um, with time. So we uh, have here our density modulation, we do the sinusoidal fat, and then at time zero, we get our point here. And then, um, um, and then we can uh, go to next time, wait a little longer before they take the picture, and then we see the um, amplitude decays. And it yeah, decays pretty fast here for, for such time scales. So it decays on the order of h bar over t. So t is the tunneling. And then there's something interesting happening. So we are keeping the phase constant of this fit. We see that essentially the amplitude inverts here uh, for a short time. And then it kind of oscillates back to uh, and it decays to zero. Okay, this is now one uh, uh, measurement versus time for a particular wavelength uh, of the modulation, of the initial modulation. But we can do that for different modulation uh, uh, wavelength and wave, wave vectors. So the green is a longer wave vector. And then you see that for very long wave vectors, the decay essentially nearly looks exponential. But it's not exactly exponential. And uh, so what our um, conclusion from that is that we cannot really explain that fully by diffusion because for diffusion, you would always expect an exponential decay. So there's something else going on. And um, to, um, yeah, and um, we essentially uh, worked with David Hughes and he suggested us this uh, hydrodynamic model to the, uh, model this uh, behavior. And the idea of this hydrodynamic model is that it's essentially just one step beyond diffusion. So we have also uh, a charge conservation, but now um, we kind of allow for an, uh, an additional current. And you see for this equation, the idea is that you have essentially a residual current in the diffusion that decays exponentially. So if you would set the time dependence of this current to zero, you uh, recover uh, the diffusion law. And with this model, uh, you can kind of take into account that there's some kind of uh, short uh, time uh, ballistic transport in the beginning. And you can uh, uh, then, by just plugging these two equations into each other, you can derive this equation for uh, the time dependence of the density. And now what you get is essentially, you don't have only the momentum relaxation rate here, gamma, so, but you also have a diffusion constant. And normally this Gamma and D are kind of related, but now we have essentially two separate parameters here in the system, which can be, uh, yeah, we, yeah, which are not necessarily related. And with that, we then do our um, a model fit. So essentially what we're doing is the data that I showed before is this one point here. So we do a simultaneous fit of all uh, K and all times for each temperature. So that's again a two dimensional data set we can uh, uh, fit that for one pair of D and gamma. And then we can take different data sets for different temperatures. And uh, with, uh, yeah, then we get essentially a different diffusion constants for different temperatures. And what we find here is that our diffusion constant gets smaller with increasing temperature. And uh, and then we get also from this fit, we get out this uh, gamma. So here the yellow points are the um, experiment and we see that uh, it's very hard to extract this uh, precisely, but we see that essentially for shorter wavelengths, we require this momentum relaxation gamma to, to get proper um, modeling of the data. And yes, and then we can compare to the Motyov regal bound that can be calculated for this diffusion. Um, and we find that it's expected that the diffusion is larger than T A squared, where A is the lattice constant over H bar. We can, uh, it's shown here in the plot, and we see that essentially it looks like the, um, the Motyov regal limit is satisfied here by the diffusion. Um, and you'll see later that, yeah, that's kind of uh, complicated, um, but um, now uh, we wanted to go forward and also measure the conductivity. And for the conductivity, um, there's also some possible complications involved because there's possibly a thermoelectric coupling. So in principle, it could happen 
that uh, if you do a density modulation, that if it decays, that then uh, there's a uh, locally uh, different temperature in different places of the system. But it turns out that uh, you, you can do some uh, in investigation and see that in our case, that is negligible. And uh, once you neglect that, you can essentially use the nernst einstein equation that the conductivity is the compressibility times diffusion constant to determine the conductivity. And now we measured the diffusion already, the diffusion constant already. So what we are missing is the compressibility. And the compressibility has been measured before in fermionic systems. And uh, in the end, what you can do is, uh, you just have to calculate this uh, derivative dn by the mu, which in the end turns out to be in a harmonic potential. You can just write it as the radial de derivative of the density um, in the uh, harmonically trapped system. And so we can do that. Um, and here the red points are the data. So we can measure the compressibility versus temperature. And we see that uh, kind of surprisingly, this compressibility is not really uh, what you uh, expect in a simple way because it's neither, neither linear nor uh, somehow exactly one over T, what you expect for the first order, um, uh, first order high temperature expansion. But you get essentially this kind of uh, shape which has like a slight kink here. And then we have various uh, theory calculations. So here the black dots are uh, quantum Monte Carlo and um, they fit essentially with an error bus perfectly. And then we have a, a temperature luxurious. Um, and uh, interestingly, the, the DMFT calculation, single side DMFT deviates here at temperatures that are within the range, within the accessible range of the experiment. But if you then do a, a cluster DMFT, um, you kind of recover the right result. Okay, so um, this all works out. So we also have now the compressibility and then we can finally put it all together and get the resistivity versus temperature by just uh, multiplying the compressibility and the diffusion constant. And then we find that essentially all these resistivities that we measure over the whole temperature range that we can access, it's essentially perfectly linear uh, within uh, error bars. And interestingly, if you now apply the module for regular limit that's typically used in condensed matter systems, um, which is in our case given by the square root of two pi over n uh, times h bar, we see that we get a violation of the small of a regular limit uh, bound that is typically used. So that leads us essentially to the reservation that uh, somehow there's something wrong with this bound possibly. And maybe the real bound you want to use is the one for the diffusion constant. Unfortunately, in condensed matter, they normally have only resistivity measurements. So that's why they uh, develop this other bound, but maybe the one has to take into account a bit more to, to make that more precise. Okay, and then we can try to uh, compare that with uh, theory calculations. And um, so there's not so many calculations that really uh, uh, can cover this whole temperature range uh, for dynamics. And what we found is essentially this finite temperature electrons measure uh, which is essentially kind of a, um, a statistical sampling of, uh, of approximate, uh, yeah, uh, exact, uh, approximate diagonalization. And this works for most of the temporal range, but not for the very lowest temperatures that we have. And it recovers kind of the linear behavior. But for example, uh, the only other technique that we could find, um, uh, people that want to do it for us was DMFT. And for DMFT, there's this weird bend here in DMFT at lower temperatures. And it seems this bend is just an artifact of theory. At least this is the only way to, for us to explain that. And it seems like DMFT seems to uh, yeah, not really cover all the effects of anti-thermodynamic correlations in the system. So you would need to do a cluster DMFT, but it seems very hard to do cluster DMFT with, um, for dynamics because of uh, complicated corrections that need to be taken. Okay, um, yeah, maybe I should make a short uh, break and ask for questions because this is kind of the first section about transport. Yeah, let me, let me maybe begin with a, with a small uh, naive question. Like the density that you show N, yes. uh, that's the total density or is it spin resolved or? No, this is the total density. So point eight is the total density. So half filling would be n equals one. And so okay. like 20% below the half filling. 
Mm -hmm. And why, like the spin nature of like the like the the two spin states don't matter, or like why, um, like why does it not enter your theory at all? And so we use a spin balanced system. So okay. the standard case is always a spin balanced, um, and of course the direction comes from the fact that we have two spin components. So if you had only one spin component, it would be a non-interacting Fermi test. Um, so, so you really get the interactions by uh, atoms sometimes hop hopping on the same side. That's essentially, or like at least virtually hopping on the same side. That's essentially what, what makes the interaction. Uh, Peter, can I ask another question? Yes. So if I understand correctly your summary of uh, your for Regal uh, your criterion, you say that like the physical criterion is that the mean free path should always be longer than the lattice constant. And like, if you look at your sketching rate, it's all fine. Only when you translate it into resistivity, then it looks like there is a violation. But physically, your parigal is really just mean free path compared to yes. uh, the uh, lattice constant to Fermi wavelength. And there is no violation of your parigal. It's kind of just looking at resistivity using electron density is misleading. Yes, yes. So, uh, so our expectation is that somehow in the der derivation of this bound, uh, someone didn't take into account the change, the temperature dependence of the compressibility correctly. That's our feeling, but it's not fully clear to us because uh, this derivation is too, uh, it's, it, it involves some condensed matter arguments that we didn't fully uh, understand deep enough to uh, say why it's wrong um, or different than the other one. Because obviously on our side of the calculation, it seems to be there's no way that, uh, that, that something changes. I mean, we know that the compressibility is right. We can calculate it exactly. Um, we're kind of surprised by that. So it means uh, that these two bounds are for some reason slightly different. Um, no, but the physical, real physical bound is mean for past versus it's, lattice constant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the main problem is that if you convert it to resistivity, uh, also the compressibility comes in effectively. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what, what, what seems to cause the uh, confusion. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I would like to ask about the hydrodynamic corrections which you included. Yes. Do you have some idea about sound? <laughs> what about is the of sound? Yeah. yeah, so the story here is in our case, the sound was very strongly damped. Um, so essentially what we have here is we essentially see not even like, like barely one oscillation. Um, so it's very hard to say what happens with sound here. Um, I think uh, in this very strongly interacting case, it's very hard to do any clear, uh, yeah, say anything clear about that from the experimental data. Um, I think if you go to a less weakly, uh, less strongly interacting, so more like a weekly or medium interacting regime, you could probably measure also properties of the sound here with a similar technique. But yeah, in this uh, in this study, essentially, we didn't really look at sound because it was just too strongly damped. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, more questions? Okay, then uh, let me just continue um, because now in the second part, um, I will, uh, want to um, show um, our plans for the new experiment here at the University of Virginia and uh, where we want to look at uh, first traded Hubbard models. And here you see already we are kind of planning a triangular lattice. And so the, question, the first basic question is essentially what happens if you have geometric frustrations in the Hubbard model. And uh, so the, for example, the Fermi Hubbard model is generally uh, antiferromagnetic, uh, has antiferromagnetic nature, but you can also kind of just think about an antiferromagnetic Heisenberg model. So if you now have a bipartite lattice where you have two sub lattices, essentially the preferred crown state is always the state where you have essentially spin up on the one sub lattice and spin down on the other. So you kind of get always uh, antiferromagnetic ordering. But now a totally different story it's a totally different story of you your frustration, for example, just uh, visible in a simple triangular baquette, because then if you put one spin up, the other one down, you don't really know what to do with the third spin. And now you can kind of try to shuffle them around, but there's a lot of possible consequences of this kind of basic uh, question. And uh, we looked a bit at uh, different properties of the triangular lattice Hubbard model and see what kind of differences there are between the square and the triangle lattice Hubbard model. 
And I uh, also looked at some uh, quantum Monte Carlo simulations um, to compare that. And here's one example. So just looking at the same compressibility that we looked at in the previous part of the talk. So this is this black curve for the um, square lattice. And if one now calculates the same compressibility at same parameters for the triangle lattice, one sees that there's essentially the same compressibility in the triangle lattice up to a point of around t over t1, where then um, the compressibility starts to deviate. And uh, I mean, this inner part was always already kind of a point of discussion before because uh, people wanted to know why is the compressibility rising so fast in the Hubbard model. And it seems some of this rise uh, is maybe really caused by uh, anti-forming equations that kind of make it uh, easier to hop on neighboring sides, essentially. Um, and yeah, this would be interesting to see that um, in a direct measurement, which would be that, that, uh, like a, yeah, uh, um, a real um, microscopic difference between the two um, uh, Hubbard models. Um, and uh, another point is uh, that model also, uh, if you look at Dublin density, and in particular, uh, interesting thing is uh, like uh, these an anomalies in the double occupancy. Uh, so if you look at the Dublin density versus temperature, also in the square lattice, you sometimes see these effects that the Dublin density essentially at low temperatures doesn't go down as one na would naively expect, but it go up again. And this is kind of an interesting feature that also happens in the triangle lattice. But interestingly, it seems to happen at uh, quite a bit higher temperature here. And uh, this might be helpful um, also for cooling because uh, it turns out that one can use uh, such an anomaly also uh, for interest uh, redistribution techniques for cooling. And uh, it's like in a similar fashion as, uh, as the Pomerantzschuk effect for, for helium-3 where you can uh, use essentially compression, but here you could also use essentially a dynamic change of the direction. To, to achieve some cooling effects. Um, yeah, so this is some kind of uh, large scale properties of the triangle lattice, but uh, one of the very interesting features of the triangle lattice is also the spin ordering, because uh, what one expects from uh, looking at the Heisenberg model on a, a triangle lattice is that you get this 120 degree spin ordering. And of course the uh, Hubbard model at uh, strong interactions is essentially um, uh, kind of, uh, yeah, uh, becomes asymptotically the, the Heisenberg model. So you would also expect to see this 120 degree ordering in the Hubbard model at some point. And you get essentially this ordering with three sub lattices where the, where the um, uh, spins are aligned by 120 degrees from side to side. And um, this is, yeah, this would be possible to, to observe essentially directly in a quantum gas microscope. And we also have some calculations um, and it really seems like, um, yeah, in the beginning we thought like in a um, frustrated system you wouldn't expect strong spin correlations, but it turned out that, uh, yeah, the spin correlations are surprisingly strong. And now if you kind of look at nearest neighbor, next nearest neighbor correlations, you see that um, for these parameters, uh, you will see seven and a half tunneling and 0.3 uh, T temperature, which is kind of within the experimental regional regime that, um, you get essentially exactly the same signs of the correlations that you expect from the 120 degree ordering. So you would expect that uh, the nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor are both negative here, while the one around the corner is positive. And that's essentially exactly what you find here uh, at this value. So, we, so it seems like it's, uh, it might be possible uh, to really see directly uh, short range 120 degree ordering in the, in the Harvard model, in the microscope. Okay, and in the following, I wanted to discuss also some uh, possible topological properties of the system. And for that, I wanted to show, first show the difference between different topological uh, systems, because most of the experiments that have been done by now are essentially working with non-interacting topological systems, where essentially the whole physics is based on uh, single particle physics. So that's like, um, for example, the uh, integer quantum Hall physics or topological band structures, where essentially, if you could only measure one particle, you essentially learn already effectively everything and you just use several atoms to increase your statistics. 
And things that have been observed, for example, very nicely with cold atoms are these uh, skipping orbits along the edge of the system, where you can really kind of explicitly image these skipping orbits. But um, the real challenge is essentially for topological systems to, to go to uh, interacting topological systems, uh, where you real, have real many body physics. And that's, of course, uh, uh, things related to the fraction quantum Hall effect, or also um, a quantum spin difference where you then get essentially these, um, these fractional excitations. And um, yeah, there's different approaches to going to uh, topological quantum systems. Uh, for example, it's been orbit coupling has been widely applied in, um, in cold atoms, but there are also techniques to essentially uh, make use of the analogy between Carl Lewis and Lorentz force to, um, uh, to use uh, and then use lattice shaking or rotation of the system to, to create uh, such coupling. Um, and there's uh, different more exotic approaches like optical flux lattices, but uh, our approach will now be uh, essentially looking at geometric frustration to suppress uh, ordering and then see uh, how uh, topological states can, can appear. And there's a recent study uh, that found uh, uh, that confirmed the chiral spin liquid in the triangle lattice Hubbard model. So if you look at what they found, so this this paper um, down here um, versus interaction, then at low interactions, you essentially find a, a gapless metal. And then at high interaction, you expect uh, you get your spin ordered mod insulator, but then there's some intermediate phase, which is supposed to be, um, uh, which is a non-magnetic insulator. And in this range, into this thing, you also, if you look at this um, um, chiral ordering parameter, you find that you that, that numerically in this uh, large scale DMG calculations, they find essentially a finite value for this um, uh, for this chiral ordering. So, and, and this kind of then together gives you uh, the result that you essentially expect this to be a chiral spin liquid. And the big question is now, is there any chance uh, to detect this in the experiment? And uh, how would one do that? And that's kind of what I want to discuss a bit in the following slides. So essentially, how can one uh, detect uh, chiral ordering in a, a microscope? So for that, one needs to look essentially at this chiral ordering parameter, which I call chi um, here. And it's essentially this triple product of spins on a triangular plaquette. And um, it turns out that if you have a finite system, you cannot really get um, it, it, this, this uh, measurement has to essentially be at zero because you cannot get a symmetry break, time reversal symmetry breaking in a finite system. So there are essentially two things necessary. Either you have to apply a symmetry breaking field by hand, or you have to detect correlations between the sides. And here I want to make the point essentially that quantum gas microscope can detect uh, such uh, chiral correlations. And let's look at that. Uh, so essentially this is the chiral ordering parameter. It's the strip product of the three spins. But now you can essentially write out this thing and it, essentially it's a bunch of these uh, three point spin correlators. And now you can essentially write these out and in terms of the quantum gas microscope language, which is essentially the up and down spin density. And then you figure out that this all kind of cancels out and you end up just with the singles up and singles down densities in uh, three. So it's essentially a lot of a single, um, a three side uh, spin up or spin down density correlators. And uh, these can be in principle measured. And in particular, one can also uh, calculate the correlators then between uh, two triangles. And to really perform the measurement, what you need is essentially you need um, uh, you need these correlators of this type, which means you have to kind of perform local spin flips. So what you need to be able to do is essentially to split this spin by uh, uh, from the Sx to Sc basis. And we are planning to do that essentially using a spatial light modulator and then using co-propagating Raman brains to, to essentially do side result spin flips in the lattice. And as long as the lattice spacing is large enough, that should be possible. Okay, so this is uh, my outlook on how, how one can uh, possibly detect this chiral correlations. And now in the last uh, uh, few minutes, I wanted to show um, 
our focus at the experiment at the University of Virginia. So we now, I now have like a full uh, ultra cold atom experiment set up. Here it's kind of the main vacuum chamber um, and the optics. And here's our laser system um, for laser cooling. So this is kind of all the lasers that you need for laser cooling and imaging of the atoms. And then, uh, yeah, we got a, a magneto optical trap of fermionic lithium-6. So you, you see that here nicely through the top window. And the big advantage of lithium-6 is the slide uh, has, uh, so we can look at fast dynamics and we can tune uh, interactions from attractive to repulsive. So therefore it's kind of an ideal choice for doing Hubbard physics. And we also achieved uh, alter called systems like molecular BAC. So this is kind of one way to detect the molecular BAC. You kind of uh, look at the inversion of the aspect ratio of the cloud. So here it's kind of elongated in vertical direction and then the direction changes in the horizontal. So that's just because the momentum spread is larger in horizontal direction. In the beginning, it's larger uh, after a certain time of flight. And then we also set up now a triangular lattice. So, and this is essentially our one picture that kind of nicely demonstrates that we have a triangular lattice. So this is a scattering picture of a BC uh, of the triangular lattice. So you get this so-called kapitza dirich scattering, and then you get essentially momentum components uh, created by the by the uh, short pulsed um, interaction with the triangular lattice. And you get to see this nice triangular uh, structure. And we also started calculating all the uh, properties like, um, yeah, money of functions and so on at the lattice to determine our interactions and tunneling. And yeah, then uh, currently we're working on Raman sideband cooling to image the atoms in the lattice. So the idea is essentially we drive with the Raman lasers transitions that reduce the vibrational quantum by one in each cycle. And then the idea of Raman sideband cooling is that you repump in a very deep lattice in the lamp decay regime to kind of repump the atoms back into the same vibrational quantum. And then you have a cycling uh, cooling uh, a cycle. Yeah, you have a cooling cycle and that cools in each cycle the atoms by one vibrational quantum. So you have some setup here of these cooling beams and uh, we hope to uh, uh, image the atoms soon in the, in the lattice. And yeah, so we did the first measurements here. And for example, here, that's kind of a direct demonstration that we can do a Raman transition. So we see here the carry transition of lithium. So we don't change the vibrational quantum and then you see the one where we reduce by one vibrational quantum on one, where we increase by one vibrational quantum. And here we see essentially that our oscillation frequency is about one megahertz in the lattice, the harmonic oscillator vibration frequency. And uh, recently we also have an ultra called Fermi gas. So this you can check by you, uh, comparing a Fermi fit to your experimental data, which is the right box with the Gauss fit. And you see that clearly the Fermi fit fits better and we get a temperature of about 0.1 TOT. Okay, with that, I want to conclude. Um, so, um, I told you about uh, back metallic transfer in a Fermi Hubbard system, and uh, we observed T linear resistivity. And there's a lot of questions remaining here. In particular, we didn't really look at the dependence on, on interaction here because uh, there was so much data that we had to take that we kind of uh, wanted to do something else afterwards. And there's also possibilities to uh, maybe measure magneto resistance or related quantities. And then I showed you uh, our plans for the triangle lattice Hubbard model um, that uh, yeah, we are close to single site imaging and we, we are planning to look at uh, spin spin correlations and possibly uh, look and looking into ways to get this parallel order. Okay, and then there's a uh, lot of uh, things to go from there. And we also looked a bit at possibilities to uh, put fermions in higher bands, for example, in the P-band. So you put three fermions on the side, you get uh, interesting physics uh, here. And in particular, you get essentially two spin decrease of reading that are, uh, decrease of freedom that compete. Um, that's kind of an interesting system that we are thinking about implementing. And um, then uh, for starting from the triangle lattice, there's a lot of options. One is also to try to implement a cargo lattice. And one idea is to essentially use repulsive laser beams to kind of punch out certain holes in the lattice and thereby implement a cargo lattice. And of course, one of the big questions here, um, 
there's uh, yeah probably a nice interplay between transport and frustration that we, we are planning to explore. Okay, with that, I want to uh, thank the people in the Princeton group. So that's my first uh, group slide uh, for, from the group of Vasim Bakke. That was the people involved in the first experiments on Batman A transport. Um, yeah, the yeah, credit students and uh, our theory support. And uh, then for my own group, uh, that's the people that set up the experiment. So I'm working with Pierre Zhu Liu as credit student and Jin Zhang, who had a big influence in building the experiment. And then I've been working also with a variety of undergrads, uh, modeling and calculating a lot of properties and also helping with that. Okay, um, so just um, at the end of my talk, thanks a lot for your um, attention and uh, let me know your questions. Yes, uh, thank you first uh, for a very nice uh, talk. Lots of, lots of information, lots of slides and a nice overview. So um, yeah, please, some questions. Maybe, uh, maybe I can start, like you mentioned, a molecular BC with uh, lithium. That was just like very briefly, maybe you can go a bit more. Uh, okay, yeah, so. I went a little bit faster on that. Um, so, um, so this is just essentially a little bit uh, on the experimental side. So the story is that if you um, um, have a fermionic lithium, you can essentially, by evaporating at the right place, uh, lithium forms molecules between spin up and spin down atoms. And then you essentially can condense these. And so you get like a, 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 a fermi, uh, like a pool. So you get, you convert the fermions to bosons and these bosons then condense. Okay, and so, and so the composite, so okay, and the composite yeah. bosons like sit on one side then, like they. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, this is not in a lattice. So it's just a big gas of molecules. Ah, okay, right, right. Um, yeah, so we have loaded some of that into the lattice, but uh, yeah, the, at this scale, it doesn't look different, you know. Um, okay. So at this point, the main th uh, point here that I uh, want to show is that we have, uh, we reached the required temperatures to do interesting physics in the mm -hmm. uh, But yeah, uh, so we are currently working on more details on the letters and um, we have loaded some atoms in the letters, but the problem is if you don't have the corresponding imaging techniques, you cannot show anything. You know? It's like uh, working problems. Could I ask a question actually? Uh, it's sure. a little technical. So you show this like Raman said been cooling and you show this yeah. like three standard pictures there. Why they're not go to zero like a... Uh, what is not going to zero? So the next picture when you show the, the, the like excitation of different cyber, why like your feet like it doesn't goes to zero like for... for ah, the, yeah, so we have some detune. offset here. Hmm? Or what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, like what is that offset actually? Uh, this offset, yeah. So it seems, yeah. So we have some uh, uh, some offset. It might be that we have some atoms in the wrong spin state. So I mean, the spectroscopy always works by transferring atoms from one spin to the other spin state. And if you have atoms in the wrong spin state from the start, you uh, get some offset. Um, it can be also that we have some some background light somewhere. So um, so we are still investigating what exactly causes this offset. It's kind of weighing, and also our signal is very low. You see, like an optical density point two is essentially. I mean, it might be that it's even just noise rectification by Gaussian fitting to noise, uh, partially, because um, um, yeah, the the signal is just very low for these measurements at the moment. Great, thanks. Um, are there more are there more questions? Yeah, I would like to ask about the bad metals, yeah, because uh, it's interesting, it's uh, correlated to localization uh, event, uh, if you have a disordered system, yeah? Yes. Uh, did you study something which uh, shows the localization yeah, of the wave function? Uh, because you have a many body problem, generally speaking, yes. it's maybe more interesting, yeah? Yes, uh, did we look at localization? Um, um, I mean, in principle, the atoms, so, so what, what kind of localization are you thinking about, like uh, in space, that the atoms get stuck in a certain place, or? Ah, your, your uh, microphone is off. 
Your microphone is off. I think you have to activate you, unmute mute yourself and say that again. No, no, sorry for this, yeah, guys, yeah, I mute myself, yeah. I try to mention that, okay, uh, and uh, for example, when people study mod in semiconductors, yeah, uh, this donor band, yeah, and localization, yeah, uh, before mod transition, yeah, you have um, many interesting things, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly it was a single particle approach all time, yeah. Uh, probably in your case, you have a many body system and this bad metals, yes. maybe signal about localization also, that wave function and yes. not uh, propagate from age to age. Yeah, it's localized, or at least some region of uh, wave function localized. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in principle, we don't know what, sh I mean, we don't see localization in sense. I mean, the atoms have a tunneling rate of one kilohertz. So if there would be a single atom around, it would tunnel with one kilohertz. And uh, we always see that the signal decays. I mean, I would expect that if you have localization, that you have regimes where the density modulation doesn't decay completely. And we always see complete decay of the density modulation that we imprint. So, so we don't see um, a signatures for localization. Yet. No, I just, uh, again, was point that uh, if you have a bad uh, conductance, you may have, a, uh, as a result, uh, you may have a superconductor, you may have a dielectric. Yeah? The question, what's ah, yeah, going I mean, we're not superconducting. <laughs> that's, that's pretty clear. <laughs> um, so, so for